poem is called Variations on a Half-Remembered Theme. This is a tale. Once in a land of ice, two children lived. They were twins. The boy knew he would do great deeds. Meanwhile, the girl dreamed only that one day she'd become a mother. And further off in an icier land, a witch allowed no change. The world froze in her mirror. Another tale. A girl enters a mirror to find herself in a different world of ice. She takes her pack, sets out to conquer the witch, while at home there are tasks to be done. So the boy sits and sews. His virtue pleases his mother, who praises him in these words, just like a girl. Another story. One day a robber girl climbs on a horse, they canter into the mirror to steal its wealth. The robber girl has no mother. No one has taught her to tremble or halt at the ice or to pause for pity's sake. She passes the boy who stumbles and slips. She leaves him as prey for the witch. The boy stumbles and falls. He is prey for the witch and forgets his home, forgets his mother, the girl, and knows only the witch's body it is a boy and that something within him froze. A sliver of mirror, perhaps it was. Or colder, a sliver of ice. He calls the witch my love and sometimes mother. Mothers are made to mourn. Here is a mother who knows she has lost two children to the witch and she cannot grieve. Her heart, like the world, is ice and the snow falls. She can find no grave for the girl she once was, nor can she see in the mirror anything real. There's no girl there, no boy. You want a conclusion? Happiness for the boy, the twins restored at length to a grieving mother. Imagine it then. The mother looks in the mirror, two children emerge, she smiles as the witch shrivels or melts. Elsewhere, the robber girl canters away on her horse across the ice. But perhaps the boy in his heart still longs for the witch, as the mother prays for the days when she was a girl. As for the mirror, it's there. Just look in the ice. Oh, thank you so much for that, Cathy. That was absolutely spellbinding. I, I, I just love your poetry and I love the way you read it as well. Um, okay, so the first question is, um, and you can be take it as directly or indirectly as you like, um, when and how did you first know you were a writer? Well, I don't think I ever thought of myself as a writer, but rather writing as the thing that I do to connect to the world. It's the way I respond. And I can't remember when I first wrote. I know that my parents had books that I wrote when I was five or six, and that I was once interviewed for a newspaper when I was six years old, and I announced that my hobbies were playing chess and writing poetry. I'm just glad <laughs> nothing has, I'm just so glad nothing survived from those early years. I can imagine how my ideas of poems would have been really terrible at the time, but. Uh, it's just something I've always done. I've always played with mm. words. Uh, my mum did. I just thought it was what everybody did. Yeah. Not, not get published, just write. So what happened when you discovered that it's not what everybody did, was it? Kind of a bit I, of a shock. I still a bit of a shock. I still think that's a bit weird. Yeah. Yeah, I know, I I mean, know what you mean. I mean, I know they don't, but... And I know there are other ways of in, in, interacting with the world through music, through sport, through all sorts of activities. And yet it's quite hard to, I have to think quite hard about people who, who don't write. So when I discovered way back when that I had my great grandparents, some of them didn't, probably didn't read or write and marked X's on documents. And that's not always a sign of illiteracy, but in one case, there was a great grandmother who signed her name with great care and misspelt it, which I think oh. and elsewhere she signed with X's. Um, so I'm thinking back, not very far back in my family, 
it wasn't the activity of writing. Now, I think best with a pen in my hands. Oh, I know Perhaps. what you mean. I know what you mean. I'm like that. I'm, I'm, if I'm listening to somebody, I have to be yeah. taking notes. Even yes. if I don't read them back, it just makes yeah. it go into my head yes. so much more easily. <laughs> so you said to interact with the world. Is that mm. um, to? Is it kind of either or both to make a difference to the world or to increase your understanding of the world? I think it's just the way sense. I making sense of the world, I think, rather than assuming that there's going to be an audience out there. Mm. It's just that that's something I do and have always done. I've tried to stop it occasionally. It doesn't work. No. <laughs> I'll stop it for a while and then I'm back to the writing. Yes. Oh, don't stop. Please don't stop. <laughs> um, so what are you writing at the moment? Oh, lots. Um, obviously some standalone poems and short stories, because I usually do. I've always got a couple of short stories on the go. I've been editing two novels, and I haven't got a publisher for them at the moment, and I've started on a third, rather to my surprise. Um, and I'm working on a long sequence. It's been going on for some years now, where I'm doing research in archives about James Watt, and yes, I do mean the steam engine man. Yeah, I've, I've uh, <laughs> seen your posts on Facebook, things you've discovered about him. Yes. Absolutely I fascinating. I, I just got hooked on that story, that era, those people, and the people mm. who were contingent to James Watt and the changes in society at the time. There's something really inspiring for, for poets in particular, I think, mm. about delving into a topic really, mm. really deeply and knowing absolutely yeah. everything, mm. the ins and oh, outs. Oh, but if only I could. <laughs> um, I, it started with the workshop in the science museum which has about 8,000 items in it some I oh. unidentified and I thought I'll go and see if there's a book on him in the British Library I think there's a poem here so I went to the British Library and found this fantastic biography of Watt which had all sorts of odd anecdotes that didn't make it into the later biographies like as a teenager somebody gave him a head the head of a child to dissect oh I mean, yes, quite. Wow. I mean, this is and this is somehow gets dropped from later biographers. <laughs> yeah, I can um, see why, but oh yes. my goodness. <laughs> yeah, um, I still I don't know quite how to do, deal with it. I thought, oh, there's po possibly two or three poems here. Um, I wonder if there's an archive. I didn't know then that James Watt had invented, not only invented a copying machine, um, but had taken copies of most of his correspondence. <gasps> and... <gasps> So I went to the Burm archive, which is in Birmingham, and they said, well, you'll have to decide from the catalog, look at the catalog, make an appointment to spend a day looking at the catalog. I thought, that's ridiculous. I've got to make a journey just to look at a catalog. The catalog fills two and a half bookcases. Good grief. And they kept everything. I said, oh. uh, but you can find a little bit of china that Watt's second wife got. She'd, she'd broken a cup or something and she wanted it matched. So she sent James Watt a piece of the broken china. It's still there in the archive. Oh, how the, lovely. The lock of his first wife's hair that he kept in his notebook after she died. All his notebooks, all his accounts. It would take more than a lifetime to read all the material there. Yeah. And so I'm having to make things up. Oh, <laughs> Which wow. is uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable. I don't want to make things up, but I, <laughs> I do need to imagine. Yeah, you kind of have to fill in the gaps, don't you? You sort of build, build it on a framework of what you know. And then... My first thought is, can there be any gaps here? But mm. of course, there are, there are dreams. There are the things you don't talk about. There's the imagination. Yeah. And there's the characters who only perhaps have exist in two or three, three mentions in the archive. Oh, it's that's... got quite big. Yeah, I'll bet. So I mean, I've got a... I'm it's... getting on for 50 pages of poems now and it's growing. Oh, wonderful. Do you, th do you think you'll ever try and get them published? Yes, I hope so. Some, a... of them have, some of them have been published already. I, read mm. some, I, gave, I gave a reading at the big international James Watt conference last summer, which went down surprisingly well to an audience of Watt specialists, engineers and so on. And the engineers were fascinated by how poems were put together, which was great. Oh, that's great. Yeah, <laughs> I like that. Yes. Um, give, give me a, a blueprint for writing a poem. And, uh, well, well, they realised they realised that you would experiment and try things out and change things, uh, which a lot of people who 
you know, who, who assume it's just inspiration don't realise. And they were thinking about the shape of the poem on the page, and that seemed totally relevant to them and sensible that you'd think oh, about wow. that. Um, yeah, it's, it's so, interesting, isn't it, how um, often scientist types and poet types yeah. overlap? And, yes. And you can kind of see why, can't you? Yeah. I've yeah. met some lovely people there. It's a great experience. And I think the Newcomen Society has published one of the poems. And then there's some in a, um, an article I wrote about a romantic biography about the later period of James Watt's life. Mm. Um, okay, so how has this horrendous time that we're living in, uh, the COVID-19 and the lockdown, affected your writing life? Well, it's been a... A really weird time because I had to, I had a sore throat just beforehand and, and David and I, my partner, had to make a decision about what we'd do and we decided to stay together, whatever happened, um, thinking that would be, oh, we'd have to spend three weeks together, we could enjoy <laughs> three weeks together. Um, and also, um, I suppose just worried a bit about mm -hmm. what was going to happen and having to stay in. No, we can do it. It's only a short time. Mm -hmm. And yeah. and actually, actually, it's you know, the, I'm not going to say it. we're we're so lucky to be together. We're lucky to have each other. We're lucky to look after each other. Mm -hmm. But then we're in a small space, and I'm used to having privacy for writing. I'm used to be able to take long walks, which were banned, if you remember, at the beginning of lockdown. Yeah. Yeah, and when I felt like writing, I'd go into a pub or a cafe and write for a couple of hours. Yes, I'd take my writing stuff with me. I'd find quiet, um, and you can't do that. Um, suddenly, Virginia Woolf's statement about needing a room of one's own um, becomes very pertinent. <laughs> yes, um, yeah. I've adopted an armchair, <laughs> a very comfortable armchair, <laughs> but it's not quite the same thing. <laughs> and. Um, yeah. And also because I'd just stopped working as a lecturer just beforehand, I hadn't really worked out a writing routine. Mm -hmm. And just yeah. as I was beginning to, it's all vanished again. And I can't get to the libraries for my James Watt research or for any books. No, of course. Um, so I've been a bit cut off from things. But I have done some writing. I started um, by editing some stuff. So I went back to the two novels that I've got and I thought, I've got I'm going to go back to those novels and do an edit. So I did that. Um, wrote some short stories, wrote a couple of poems, did a bit of writing about, in a sort of poetic style about lockdown for a while, just to keep my hands in. Wrote a couple of monologues, which nobody wanted, why should they? <laughs> um, sent some stuff out uh, with some su success, got commended in a competition, edited well stuff edited stuff that's got edited a couple of short stories to going into a magazine so it's not been entirely disastrous but I haven't had that concentrated time I was dreaming of mm -hmm. I would yeah. I would have liked yeah. that yeah. so it's and I'm, I'm back I'm back at James Watt now I yeah managed, I have drafted out three poems and I nearly made that all the sort of I nearly made the sort of awful mistake you make when um you're not doing the research properly and you're not looking things up because I nearly wrote a poem about vaccination uh, but it was in 1783 before it was vaccination it was inoculation yeah. Yeah. so I went back and looked at what inoculation meant and its roots in the grafting of fruit and so on and thought oh that's interesting so it became a slightly <laughs> different poem yeah <laughs> but yeah, I the, um, the roots of words can really lead you down some interesting yes. paths can't they Yes, but vaccination, it suddenly hit me that the word vaccination came in 12 years later. Mm. <laughs> it sounds so little, but it's know. a different procedure. I mean, yeah, yeah. Because so, vaccination... No, I'm not going to ask what the difference is because uh, we're not sitting in a cafe talking. <laughs> oh, I shall, <laughs> tell you, I shall tell you anyway, vaccination isn't so dangerous because you're using cowpox. Oh, Inoculation right. is actually using the material from the pox of smallpox. Oh, so see. it's potentially yeah. fatal. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> makes sense. Yeah. Um, how have you, do you think you've described any sort of, uh, discovered any surprising inspirations from the whole lockdown situation? Not for instant use, but I've been going on some absolutely wonderful walk, walks. And the problem with that is that everything's very intense. 
So it's absolutely wonderful. You look around at nature and you think, wow, oh, I can find out all the names of those grasses. Mm. And I have been trying to find all the names of the grasses and there's so many of them. Um, watching a kestrel, watching, um, watch, watching a, a woodpecker for about 15 minutes. You know, it's wonderful. Oh very, very intense. But at the moment, it's too much. Mm. And there's a quotation, Bill Douglas, the filmmaker, quoted Chekhov to say that you have to filter um, and just keep it as if, as if you're sieving what's in your memory and mm. see what remains. And I, the filtering process hasn't taken place yet. So I'm hoping there'll be some work from that, but it could be a long time off. Yeah. <laughs> sometimes, it take, sometimes it takes years for a poem to be there or a story or whatever, and it, it's not always what you expect. Yeah, that's true. I quite often find that um, something will stick in my mind and mm -hmm. I'll think, how can I write about that? How can I write about that? And then something else almost completely irrelevant <laughs> will come along and you, you put the two together mm -hmm. and it just somehow makes it work. Yeah. And that, I guess, is a way of sort of mm -hmm. filtering it. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, I've seen yeah. your photos of your walks and they just, <laughs> it looks like you've had the most amazing time. It's been absolutely wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, no, I'm glad. Mm -hmm. um, are you finding ways of engaging with the writing community at all? Is that something you do anyway? No, no and again, because I've just left the creative writing department, I'm a bit cut off from what had been my main writing community. And that's a particularly sad fact that Five Leaves Bookshop is closed. Mm, yeah. And <laughs> I can't go to any events at Five Leaves, and I want to be in Five Leaves Bookshop, so... <laughs> yes, oh, I do know that feeling. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's where I'd find my writing community and I'm not there. Yeah. Nor is, any, nor is anybody except Russ from what I can gather. Oh, oh no, Jane, Jane is there Jane's now, back she? now, yes. Yeah. So we're all going in on Friday for our briefing oh. of uh, how the opening's going to go. So oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, open again next week. <gasps> that's Can't exciting. Yeah, yeah, very exciting. Mm. Um, who would you say inspires you? either a writer or yeah. anyone really? I, I don't really go in for being inspired much. Um, I admire things that people write and things that people do and I want to know how they did the crafting. Um, I read a lot of WH Auden who I wrote my thesis on. I read a lot of contemporary writers in all sorts of genres from, I, I've been reading a lot of sci-fi dystopia lately Mm. Um, N.K. Jemison, uh, Octavia Butler, yeah. uh, Ursula, Ursula Le Guin, and Jen Slonchewski, who's a, an American writer who's not as well known here as she might be, who's very interesting. A lot of hard science, a lot of difficult ethical questions. Oh, that's very good brilliant. combination. Maybe you could send me that and I can add it to the end I of shall. the video when, uh, when I publish it. I'll tell it. you about Jen Slonchewski, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. that'd be great. Yeah. Um, um, and, but, oh, one person who I think inspires me is an 18th century writer called Mary Collier. Now, Mary Collier, no, she was a working class poet, labouring class, and in 1736, she wrote a feminist response, we'd call it now, to a poem by another labouring class poet, Stephen Duck, and she, it was called The Woman's Labour. And it's written in heroic couplets, in a style that's as confident as Alexander Pope using heroic couplets with mm -hmm. classical references. Um, and she talks about the double burden of women having to look after their children in the house as well as to go working in the fields, what it's like to be a charwoman, what it's like to be a laundress. And I went and looked at her one publication in the British Library. And there's so much marvellous stuff there. Um, she's so witty and you know, she never made a fortune from her writing. Stephen Duck became a clergyman and so on, but there wasn't really that opportunity for a woman writer. And yet there she is doing something quite exceptional, doing it extremely well. And all we know about her really are her poems and, her, and the patrons who got her poems published. Mm. So I'll go for Mary Collier. Yeah, she sounds fascinating. I shall uh, a woman's see labor. what I can dig out about on her. Yeah. A woman's labour. Yeah. yeah. Definitely try and get hold of a copy of that. 
Um, what would you say you're most proud of in your writing career? I don't go in for that much. Um, I was very pleased that when with Siobhan Logan and Emma Lee, I edited the refugee anthology, um, Overland Oversea. Mm. Um, that went out, that reached a lot of people. And it's the editing work there that I was pleased with. Um, one of the things I did was to work out the sequence. Oh, and I suggested the title, I think, at some point yes, in that long process yes. and how to do the cover. You did the cover, but I suggested a way of working on it, which seemed to work. Yeah. And, yes. and I was pleased that it went out to an audience where some people were reading it because they were concerned with refugees and they perhaps got into some poetry as well. Mm. And, po and poets were learning about refugees and it raised money, it did a good thing. Yeah. Um, so that was great. Yeah, I, I was pleased I was working on that. But that's luck. Yeah, I don't know. I mean... And I'm pleased with some of the... Well, with all the students I've taught. Yeah. But again... I mean, I, I, yeah, I've spoken to some of the people you've taught and you are an excellent teacher. Well, um, watching the students progress, it's what they do and yeah. they just need somebody there. Um, so it's been good to teach and to, to, watch, to watch them develop as poets. Yeah. Do you miss that? I miss the students, I don't miss the stress, and I don't miss mm, no. the stress in the university sector where you can't really give all the help to the students you want to give or spend the time with them you want to, and then just being very, very tired. Mm -hmm. In the end, yeah. the, tire, the tiredness, the stress, that got to me in the end, so I, it, it was time to go. Yeah, because at one point you were thinking that you were so overwhelmed with everything you might have to stop writing yeah and yes. uh, i remember that being quite a that was awesome time. yes yeah. and i went for the writing well, and i went but i couldn't i couldn't have done my job properly i, I was worried that i wasn't doing it well enough mm, and also yeah. that it wasn't possible to do it well enough anymore mm, yeah yeah sometimes situations arise like that don't they mm. and there's just yeah. nothing you can do about them yeah i think I'm, um I miss the students. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure they miss you. They've got other very good teachers. They've got some excellent teachers yeah, there. And I'm sure they're true. doing fine. Yeah, this is true. Um, so what do you hope to achieve in the future? Oh, well, obviously, I'd like to get my novels published. I, I, all I have to do is to gear up the confidence, find an agent. Find, that agent has to fall in love with my novels and think, wow, let's take those to the world. Um, I'd like to, th to get the James Watt poems finished mm -hmm. and to write some more stuff that I believe in. Yeah. Do you, think, do you think that James Watt's poems will ever be finished? I hope so. Um, I'm more than halfway <laughs> through. I'm more than halfway through. Um, okay. I'd like, I, I, I sort of know where it's going. Um, I've got a linking narrative now, so I'm not just writing odd poems. And I, I, I think it can be done, but it's probably another year or two. Mm. That's fascinating because I've I've never written a sort of sequence of poems mm. before. You know, I've written bits and pieces and poems, yeah. are, mm. a set of poems on the same topic. Yeah, I've never sort of written it in a structured way. Well, I didn't start it in a structured way. And I knew I'd have to find a structure to carry it, and I also knew that I wanted the voices of ordinary people at the time. So mm -hmm. I'm trying to get a sort of jangling, uh, probably. Sort of, the effect is a sort of jangling strict form that isn't quite strict enough yeah. for the so it's a sort of popular song or something like that to carry the narrative through and I'm hoping I can do that so it's the voice of different crowds really because mm. there are lots of mobs that appear at various times from the church and king mobs that attack people in Birmingham to the French Revolution, there's the Gordon Riots. Yes, of course, James Watt was there at the time of the Gordon Riots. Um, people objecting to the Albion Mill. So I thought actually having a popular voice going through it might carry the narrative. It may not work, I may change my mind and do something entirely different, but uh, that's where I am at the moment. Uh, it sounds, sounds excellent. I do hope you do get it published soon and I can <laughs> read it. Um, Okay, so that was all the questions I had. I've mm. got a short poem to read us out with. Yes, yes, it's a it's a poem from the James Watt sec section. Oh, sorry, it's a poem from the James Watt sequence called Sicilian Boy, and it's about a 
a servant that James Watt Jr., James Watt's son, brought back from Sicily, uh, where had gone to hide after being caught up in the reign of terror, uh, being threatened with a treason trial in England. Um, so he went to Italy on his way before coming home, and he brought back this Sicilian teenager as a servant, a, a guy called Salvatore Viaggio, or Viaggio, who wasn't popular with the servants and never fitted in and went on causing trouble. So obviously I thought the mm. Sicilian boy was there. And he came back to a household where the daughter of the house was dying of consumption mm. and he was being taught to behave. So I'll read the poem, Sicilian Boy. No, try again. The sick girl guides his fingers across the slate in screeching marks she claims repeat his name. Maybe. So there it is. She spells it. You. Salvatore. But that's not him. And he's not in the voice Madama makes him say. I honour God. I serve my master, Mr. Watt. I am your most obedient, humble servant. And somewhere south is heat. Here, servants eye him askance. His master James's boy, they mumble. Then something he doesn't understand. He's not of them. He sees them wait for death. Once the girl's gone, they'll get new suits of black. He sees them glance in the glass, practice a mourning face. Her parents take her, clutch beneath her arms, rope her and spin her round, make her a whirligig, cause her to vomit, take her blood, set leeches where her breasts begin to bud. She gasps. They make her breathe strange airs. He knows this sickness knows its end, he sees. The man he won't call master comes. Take me to London, prentice me, he begs, though there's no home there. Here the house is cold and hard, filled with hard words and words he will not say, like comfort me, like love, like Take me home. Oh, thank you so much. And thank you for talking to us and uh, sharing something about your, your writing practice and your work. Lo lovely to talk to you, Pepper. Always lovely to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you.